Hello and welcome to Electric Sheep, episode 13. My name's Carl Sykes and with me this week we have our regular collaborators Paul Andrews. Hello. And Elizabeth Jones. Hello. And our special guest this week is Jamie Pragnall from Vicendi. Jamie's in to talk to us specifically about things related to technology and uh, disabilities, but that's something we'll kind of get onto in a little while and Jamie can give us some more information um, about what he and his company does. Um, but what we'll start off with, as per usual, is our kind of round robbing of what we've been up to this week. And I know Elizabeth, who's just back from her uh, her illness, um, which is why she wasn't here with us last week in the studio, um, is raring to go. So, Elizabeth, what have you been up to this week? I came across an interesting article on Edudemic, which is a nice website about mm-hmm. technology and education, for those of you who aren't in the know. And there was an article about tablet devices. Okay. Right. Um, and normally these are, you know, 50 brilliant apps to use and um, how to use them in classrooms and what to do. Mm -hmm. And this one was questioning, are um, tablet devices actually useful at all? Because we've all got them. Mm -hmm. I know we have. um, Mm -hmm. And they're brilliant and they're very shiny and very fun. We all love them. But how productive are they actually as a tool? Okay. Because everybody's trying to say why they need them, why they should have them in the classrooms, what we should be doing with them. But what do you actually do with them once you've got it? Right. I mean, that's interesting. Sorry, just to kind of butt in very quickly. But but harking back to last week's recording mm. with Dr. Carl Peters, we, we very, very sort of lightly touched upon the thing of technology for technology's sake. And, uh, you know, that when, when the iPad, for example, first came out, everybody wanted an iPad but they didn't know why they wanted one. They yeah. just wanted it because it was shiny and it did cool stuff. Um, and, and sort of as a slight tangent from that, we talked about the um, sort of smart board whiteboards and how every classroom had to have one, but nobody had the other equipment. You know, lots of schools had the smart boards, but they didn't have the other equipment that was needed to go with it. So they yeah. just had these obsolete smart boards hanging on the wall. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's quite, yeah, it sounds like quite an interesting read. Yeah, it was. And it was something that I sort of... Gave a bit of thought to because we've had our tablets for a while now. We've um, got Nexus 7s yep, from yep. Google and they're great. And I use it to look at my emails. And if I'm out um, going to see somebody around the campuses and stuff, I'll book appointments in or type myself a really quick note. But like that's probably the like the maximum sort of input stuff I'll do with it. Mm. And the way I was thinking about it was you really don't use it to do things. You use them to access stuff. So you read things or you look at websites or you watch videos or whatever. But you don't actually actively do things Mm. on them very often. So if you're trying to be productive... You're going to be using a different device. You go on your laptop because those touchscreen keyboards are a nightmare. Mm-hmm. I, I know Paul's almost certainly going to have something to, to chip into this <laughs> because because Paul's Nexus is kind of like an extension to his being, it isn't is, it? Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure you've got something. Well, uh, I mean, Elizabeth's got a very valid point that well, when the tablets were first introduced, I mean, primarily they were a tool for consuming content rather than creating content. Yeah. So... I will use, I mean, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it later on because we talk, I did a webinar this week and it was all about mobile apps. But um, I will use a, a series of, of different apps, but the, all of the apps I'll use on the tablet device all synchronize to cloud-based systems. So I won't ever use my tablet or my smartphone or whatever it might be um, in its own right. It will be a means to an end to access or modify some data that I can right. then pick up on my, my computer. I mean, I think the work that companies like Microsoft are doing with their, they've got this thing called smart glass technology, and it's kind of links to maybe uh, Jamie might have a view on this, so in terms of um, giving people another way to interface with something is quite nice. So, for example, Netflix, uh, mm-hmm. say, you can get Netflix on the games consoles and you can get Netflix on the tablets. Now, my three year old is quite happy. To, to use Netflix on the tablet because the interface is easier to use. Uh, and certainly for people who would maybe want to, let's say they want to watch Netflix content on the telly, mm-hmm. with the smart glass technology, you can actually use, you, you turn your, your tablet into a, a, a simplified controller, if you like. So people can actually just push the buttons on this glass service without it having to get their hands dirty with a like a proper Xbox 360 controller, which for some people with 16 buttons, it's a bit it's a bit scary. But I think a content content creation on tablets is notoriously difficult. I think content collection on them is great because they're portable, but it's almost like you're, you're using them to capture photographs and video footage and yeah. sound. But if you want to do anything constructive with them, you really, in my experience, need to take it into a, a computer. Uh, to be able to, I mean, yes, you know, you can get GarageBand on the iPad and it's okay, but it is still a bit of a 
Yeah, you wouldn't spend your time editing these well, podcasts. You'd, no, you'd on need the a iPad, Bluetooth mouse and a keyboard, and then you might as well go onto your laptop or your desktop because it's going to be a lot easier and quicker. And if you know, if you're working, if you're that mobile that you need your tablet, mm. where are you going to plug in your keyboard and your mouse? Yeah. So you're, you're, where are you going to rest them? Because you're probably in a corridor, like yeah. I usually am. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just just wondering if Jamie, do you do you have a tablet, and is it something you you know how have you found the use of it? Yeah, um, I, I think I agree with everything that everyone's saying, but I think we're we're sort of approaching a change now. Mm. Um, like you were saying, um, you know, a lot of the tablets that came out, they were more for kind of downloading content sure. and viewing it as an extension to the desktop. And Windows 8 has kind of sort of shaken that up a little mm-hmm. bit, and all the other um, suppliers are going the same way, mm. including. Apple and um, Google as well, mm. the Android platform. So we're now starting to see thin client solutions. Mm. So we've got Office 365 now, yeah. um, which allows you to edit um, Word, Excel, PowerPoint mm-hmm. um, within the actual browser. Mm. Um, so you don't have to be kind of really attached to the desktop anymore. Mm. Um, Google are going the same way with Google Docs. Mm. Um, so you can do all the editing on, on the laptop. Sure. And um, with the new Windows 8 tablets, you've now got the new range that's about to come out from Samsung, mm. which does come with the attachable keyboard. So yeah. it kind of yeah. doubles up as a tablet and a, and a desktop. So I think, you know, the next sort of six months is going to be quite an interesting time for, mm. for how they do become a bit more productive to, yeah. to the actual desktop. Mm. Yeah. It's just that thing with how people try and justify why they need it. It's that oh, co- yeah, I have to have one. Yeah. It'll be useful. There are all these apps you can use for education mm. and it's totally justified. And then they get it home and they watch YouTube. Yeah, or go on Angry Birds or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah, or play yeah. games yeah. because I mean, it's harder. It's, it's, I mean, I, I run... I, unsurprisingly several different blogs but I, I run a, a blog which is nothing to, it's not work related at all it's all about kind of my love of video games and I will primarily blog on my smartphone mm-hmm. but I have noticed I mean I'm, I'm quite fast at typing on a keyboard it will take me two or three times longer uh, to type a blog entry on a smartphone than it will if I'm actually at a keyboard but yeah. the one thing I I do like and again it's come back to the accessibility point of view you can have um, this. You, you can. I think. I think it's a default now on the Android ones. But you can actually have, have this. I think it's called Swift typing, where you can you can drag a thing. You can yeah. trace a line across the words, and it, you, you want to type. So rather than having to push down each time, you put your finger on the first letter, and then you draw a line down. And you, as long as you hit all of the different letters you're trying to spell, it will predict the word that you're trying to get. And then you can choose from a list of let's say three or four, and that's quite nice. Um, but I mean, but it's still not as quick as typing. Absolutely no, no, absolutely no. But I think for some people who maybe don't have the dexterity to use a keyboard uh the ability to kind of you know have essentially just one thing you need to push down and drag across might be quite helpful but yeah i mean in my experience it's not as fast as me saying oh i'll just get the keyboard and type the thing out but normally i'm not i'm not writing my blog sat down at a computer i'm normally watching the television i'm doing other things at the same time i'm kind of lazily you know sat on the sofa with with a tablet on my lap just kind of you know putting down random thoughts so mm. yeah see that's when i would actually use like a bluetooth keyboard mm. with a tablet because i'm lazy and i have got a surface to use it but mm. other than that but i think it's one of those if somebody is campaigning to get mm. a tablet bought for them or that you're thinking of investing in Absolutely. one you know for two to five hundred pounds that you're going to be laying down for for these things you need to seriously question if you actually want it if you want it just to watch youtube and use as a recipe book which is pretty much what mine does <laughs> then um yeah go for it but if you at, if you're trying to use it for teaching or education mm. or um you know, you want to use it for writing things on the go or doing um collaborative work you know like a virtual whiteboard that mm. you can scribble on use an actual whiteboard you mm, know it's yeah. cheaper yeah you know i think i think the key thing is that perhaps the education behind you know there needs yeah. to be more education behind the yeah. whys and the reasons mm. and you know this, this harks back to another podcast we did a, a few weeks ago with um i think it was andrew, andrew. that's right yeah. andrew yes and he was talking about with schools coming to him and saying we need 60 70 ipads yes. and andrew's response was well if you really need a tablet the nexus 7 for example will do that at half the price and yeah. the response was no we need ipads but why do you need them? Well, we we do. We need the students need them. Yeah. And I think that's the key thing is that there should be this education behind the whys and the reasons why you need to have these mm. things yeah. before just kind of jumping in and saying we need to splash the cash on them. So. Yeah, people need to find a way to try them out and actually see what they do. 
yeah before. as as we do within the team here we have a small number of, of ipads mm-hmm. that we allow staff to to kind of borrow take away have a little play with and, and familiarize themselves with and i guess that allows them to make an informed decision as to whether yeah. the ipad is right for them or but perhaps another tablet or whether a tablet isn't the right yeah. route to go down and maybe that's the sort of way that sure. education yeah. needs to go. Yeah. Well, the, one, the one thing I have noticed, though, um, and again, this is not specific to staff at the University of Wales Newport, is that um, when we talk, we talk to people about their, their level of confidence in using bits of kit, because the tablets, you have to be on a mission to kind of break them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? I mean I'm not talking about physically dropping them, but actually you know, pushing them on things. Whereas on a computer, I mean, you know, if you run a Windows computer, it's like, oh, I've got to remember, I need to defragment my hard drive, I need an antivirus, this, that, and the other. With the tablets, um, I've met uh, members of staff, and it's nothing to do with gender or age or anything at all, but members of staff who traditionally are a bit scared of technology, but the tablet you put in front of them, oh, I've just got to push this. Mm. Oh, and it opens. Oh, that's quite nice. So it it can be used in, in in that sense to kind of bridge that gap between people who are maybe traditionally fearful of a keyboard and a mouse and yeah. all of the wires and everything. It's the, I can just stick it in my bag and off I go. And I, mm. I, th- I think I remember when you first had your iPad, you broke it within the first three days. 24 hours. 24 hours, fantastic. First 24 hours, yeah. yeah. Paul, what have you been up well, to this week? Well, it kind of, kind of segues quite nicely from the whole kind of tablet thing. This week I was very fortunate. I was invited by um, RSC Wales, which is the Regional Support Centre for Wales. It's like a government organisation and they do, they do an outstanding job. Their job is basically to work with schools and colleges in Wales. Um, incidentally, every region of the UK has an RSC group. It's just, right. I was working with RSC Wales. But <clears throat> they, they work with the schools and colleges and the universities in Wales. Um, to support, advise them on integrating technology in a pedagogically sound way into whatever it is they're trying to do. So they invited me to take part in a, a webinar, to run a webinar for them. Um, they've been running a series of them uh, called Lunchtime Bites, spelt with a, a Y. Um, and so they said to me, can you do a webinar on free mobile apps? Because uh, they they were experiencing the same thing, this kind of this demand for the the equipment. But then what they went they were then finding was the schools and colleges were going right. We've got all this kit. What are we going to run on it? So um, I basically uh, did a forty five minute webinar, and it was the first time I'd done anything like this because I mean normally I'm I'm used to kind of I'm used to a room full of like a couple of hundred people. That's yeah. fine. But this was the first time I said right. I wanted to kind of push myself out a little bit, so I decided to use Google Hangouts to broadcast live to YouTube. So I actually did the webinar live on YouTube, which meant that I was able to say to the people who uh, are, who signed up to the RSC Wales thing, here's a link and you can watch this on any any device you like, TVs, consoles, smartphones, whatever. But it also meant that I was able to reach out to the, the lovely folks that follow me on kind of like Facebook and Twitter internationally yeah. and go, look, if you want to take part in this, yeah, okay, it's for RSC Wales, but you can join in as well. So, um, so yeah, so I, I kind of I live streamed it, and um, what I what I did was I used another another tool um, called BlueStacks, which is a free piece of software, and it lets you emulate an Android device on your Windows computer or your Mac. Right. So I was able to use BlueStacks to run the mobile apps, and then do a screen share of that to broadcast that back out to YouTube whilst I was talking over the top of it, so people could actually see what the real apps would look like if they wanted to run them. Mm. Um, but I, I said in the, in the webinar, I, I wanted to be platform agnostic, so everything I showed worked on an Android device and an Apple device as a minimum, but also had a, a either a, a desktop a, a piece of software or a web-based piece of software as an equivalent. So for those folks who were kind of interested in, in, in kind of using some of these apps but maybe didn't have the hardware, mm-hmm. it's like it's not a problem. As long as you can connect to the internet, you've got a computer, you can use tools like, you know, Evernote and Skype and Wanderlist and all these other bits and bobs I was showing to them. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing that, um, that a lot of the stuff we're talking about, and it's it's, it's great. A lot of mm. stuff we're talking about in the, in the podcast, we're able to relate back to things in previous yeah. podcasts. And and uh, the first thing that popped into my head was our talk with Dr. Carl Peters last week, yeah. when we talked about a couple of sports staff members, Andy and Charlie, who've been right. running kind of webinar sessions mm-hmm. essentially for um, potential new students to come along and get a taste and a flavour of the university yeah. without having to set foot on campus in the first instance to an actual open day. Mm. They can kind of meet and greet the staff, get a quick whistle stop talk of the, the, the campus and, and of the course itself and then if they want to take that next step and come along to an open day Absolutely. and I guess the technologies that you used are pretty similar to what pretty they similar, use yeah. Google Hangouts and uh, yeah I mean and the lovely part is that after you finished um, Google will then automatically put that video onto YouTube so I was able to turn around 
to folks who maybe came in a little bit late or just couldn't make it because it was a lunchtime session. Mm -hmm. um, and some folks in schools, for whatever reason, YouTube had been blocked. Right. So we were able to say, well, okay, if YouTube's been blocked, that's fine because by the time you get home, this video will be available to you. You can watch this when you get home if you, if you want to um, on any device that you, you care to mention. Um, so, yes, I just put it onto YouTube. I've given people a little download link as well. So I can say, look, if you want to watch it in school, download it when you're at home. Right. And then you can bring it in on a USB stick or something and watch it in school if, if you if you want to. But, yeah, it, it was just really easy. And kind of going back a couple of years ago, broadcasting to YouTube was a, a, a pipe dream. Yeah. Even 12 to 18 months ago. So it's um, it's something that's very exciting. And the, the tool set they've introduced, I, like I was able to... Uh, call up live video titles as I was talking. So if I mentioned a particular tool or, or I, I was giving out my Twitter handle, for example, I was able to, a bit like a news ticker, up, I make it flash up at the bottom. Here is the actual uh, you know, thing that you can type into Twitter to get hold of me. So yeah, um, yeah it, it, it's very, very powerful. It's very, very good. And it's all free. Which so, is always good. Yeah. <laughs> as we keep saying, <laughs> yeah. every single like free, free is good. <laughs> and, and I'm assuming, I don't think you put the video up yet but it should be with this by the time this podcast yes, comes out be, the video should be available yeah. on the uh on the podcast site for people yeah to we'll have put it at the at. bottom so, so yeah that's, that's fine yeah. fantastic <laughs> yeah. so carl how's your week been what have you been doing yeah well well this week I'm, I'm i'm kind of changing my my tack a little bit and i'm not i don't want to be talking about something that i've been doing specifically with staff mm -hmm. knowing that jamie was coming in this weekend and mm. um, we would be talking about technology specifically relating to sort of aspects of, of disability and in improving mm. um the user's uh, use of, of of technology um i thought i'd download a couple of apps to my iphone sure. um and have a little play around with them and and kind of see how they work mm -hmm. so the, the apps that i've looked at i've only looked at two and i've picked these two specifically yeah because because they tie together because they both are um, predominantly aimed towards users who have visual impairments. Mm -hmm. um, so these particular apps have seemed to crop up quite regularly um, on kind of search engines online as, as some of the better apps that are available. Yeah. So I thought I'd have a little look and kind of just see how they worked, really, because okay. they're not the sorts of things I'd normally kind of pick up on a day to day basis and, and have a play with. Mm -hmm. So. The first app I looked at was something called Color ID, and I right. had a quick word with Jamie earlier, and I know this is something he's aware of anyway. Um, and essentially, Color ID, and the great thing is it's available for, for Apple and for Android as well, cool. so that's always good. Um, essentially, what Color ID does is it lets you take a, um, or sort of hold your, your, your iPhone or whatever mm -hmm. sort of you happen to have to hand up to a particular uh, item, object, right. and it lets you know what color that object is so if you're if for example oh. if you have a visual impairment and yeah. you're not able to work out what the color is and the reason you might want to do this and there were there are numerous reasons such as mm. you picking out a tie to wear for the day yeah. but you don't know if it matches the suit that you've got yeah. on or um they had some great examples online like for example you wanted to test if your fruit had gone moldy you could hold <laughs> it up and see if there were green bits on it which i particularly like that oh, was quite this nice would be so handy friend of mine is color like, really really badly for color blindness green, absolutely yeah. Yeah, i think it's color blind yeah we play board games, and he right. can't tell the difference between the different colours on the board. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think for colour blindness, certainly, it seems like it's got some wow. really great use. Yeah. Um, and what, what I particularly like about it is there are two options. There's a kind of like a basic option, mm. and then there's something called the exotic colour option. Right. So the basic option, um, and, and actually, it doesn't just go, it's green, it's red, it's blue. It says things like, it's green with a slight blue tinge or, oh, right, or something. Okay. But the exotic yeah. one is great because it says things like, it's um sort of tropical apricot. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I'm not sure how you useful that would be necessarily but i think looking at it the basic color palette um, seems to be the Brilliant. most useful um and i can see loads and loads of reasons why mm. you'd, you'd want to pick this app up and kind of make use of it and, and as liz has just said specifically for people perhaps with color blindness this could be this could be Very great yeah. save you going out pass with... that along absolutely yeah yeah absolutely and obviously we'll put a link, we'll put to, a that link to that yeah, on the really site good. um and the other app i've been looking at which which as far as i can tell is only available on um, apple products at the mm -hmm. moment is something called VizWiz. Mm -hmm. um and it's taken me a little while to kind of get used to using it. But actually, yeah. I can see why this app could be another really useful um, tool. Essentially, what VizWiz does is it lets you take a photograph of something. Right. Let's say, for example, uh, well, I'll use the example that was online. It's not my example, and you'll know why in a second. So so the example they give online is um, you have some foundation. And the question they've asked, and these are users who've asked this, is does this foundation include any sort of um, sun protection as yeah. part of the foundation? What you can do is take a photograph of the bottle mm -hmm. um, 
And then there are a number of options of things you can do. You can record an audio message to go along with the picture. So if, mm -hmm. if the picture's not enough, you can actually record an audio message to go with it. Right. And then it gives you a number of options of places you can send the audio message and the picture to get a response. So the first thing you can do is it will allow you to attach it to it, um, an, any contact within your email address yeah. um, account and email a person to ask for a response. Mm. The next thing it will do is allow you to send it either via, um, sorry, via any of your social networking mm -hmm. um, media. So for example, you can either tweet it straight out or send it to a Facebook friend. Mm. You can send it to an automatic image processing um, um, software that mm. will give you a response back and basically read the information that's on the label and give you a response wow. back from it. Or the final version, and I think this is fantastic, is there is a live person who receives these um, questions that you will send and will reply back to you with mm. a response. Now, this is completely free. There's no yeah. cost to this app at all. It's completely free. Um, and in the test they did online with this foundation, they sent it off and asked whether it had a sunblock mm -hmm. included. And they got a response back saying, yes, it's factor 15. You can use this and it will protect you, give you some protection from the sun. Yeah. So you get a response back from a real person on the yeah. other end of the app who's waiting to respond to you. Um, this app's only been out for a couple of years. I've been looking online and it came out at around about 2011. Mm. And their stats say that they've had about 5,000 blind iPhone users use the app since mm -hmm. then. And about 50,000 questions answered within that period. That's um, and they aim to get response back to you in a minute or less, which I think is, is pretty good. That's, so, for example, someone yeah. who's in the shop and needs a quick response mm. to something... Take a quick snap of it, a quick recorded message, mm. and you'll get a response within a minute. And, it, you know, people don't necessarily want to keep asking people in the shop if you can read this or read sure, that. You know, sure. you want to be independent. Of course you do. So this kind of helps you retain your independence well, but yeah. gets the response you need. Well, presumably um, they're volunteers that are doing this as well, I guess. As far as I can tell, I mean, there's amazing. not a huge amount of information on there. Yeah. It basically just says that they're anonymous web workers. It doesn't say much yeah. more than that. But, um, yeah, I'm assuming these well, guys are volunteers who are giving up their time to kind of respond to users' queries and questions. Brilliant. So, again, so VizWiz is the name of the, of the app. And mm. um, I've only had it a couple of days, so I'd still need a bit more practice mm -hmm. and testing with it. But I think potentially it could have some really good uses. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Nice one. Okay, so we're, we're going to move on now to um, to talk to our special guest. And this week, as I mentioned earlier, it's Jamie from Vicendi. So, Jamie, if I can ask you just to um, kind of give us some information about what you do at your company and, and generally what the company does as, as a whole. And, and actually, it'd be nice to know how you're linked to the University of Wales Newport, because I know there is a link existing. So, um, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, back in 2009, um, I set up Vicendi, um, which was... Uh, mainly um, to really help disabled students mm. um, access education that perhaps they wouldn't normally be able to to access. Um, I've been through the teaching process myself, so mm. I still do do teaching. Um, I'm dyslexic as well, mm -hmm. so I've seen it from both sides. Um, and the main sort of focus of the business then was to kind of look at assistive technology under the DSA, um, the Disabled Student Allowance. Mm -hmm. and so kind of look at integrating that around the educational context and also their, their disability as well. Okay. And and um, and how are you kind of tied into to the university here? Because I, I know I actually met you a couple of weeks ago when you were chatting to our student services department and you were kind of working on some things with them. So so how, how has that link come about? Yeah, so, um, so students here, when they get their needs assessments done um, to identify what, what needs they might have um, to support them, in, in education. Um, one of the things that will be part of that service will be the assistive technology training. Mm -hmm. So um, Newport approached us um, about, they'd heard about some of our work and said, would you provide assistive technology training to mm -hmm. our students? Um, we're local, locally based. We've got um, Welsh trainers as well. So um, it was an obvious step for us to to kind of get a service up and running for, for Newport and the surrounding area. Right. And how, how does that su um, support take place? I mean, do you do you come over here and, and work directly with the students or kind of on a one-to-one -one basis or is it an yeah. online thing or how, how does it work? Yeah, it's kind of going, it's going both ways now, um, but primarily it's one-to-one -one support. So we tend to go around to the students' address or meet them on campus in the library. Okay. Um, but we're also now offering webinars online. So um, for students that might just want quick bite bite-sized chunks mm -hmm. of information we can do you know remote webinars um, between us and the 
and, and them. So. Right. Okay. Okay. And and kind of is there a have you found that there's a particular technology that or a particular need? Sorry, that you, that's coming up quite regularly that that you're dealing with at the moment. Is there a particular need that sort of seems to be resurfacing quite regularly? Yeah. Um, it's. I mean, it's gone through a lot of changes. Um, I mean, DSA has been around for a good ten years or so. Mm. Um, it's really exciting time because obviously, mo- as as you're all talking about today, you're talking about mobile. Yeah. Um, apps yeah. um, and that's opened the field a lot more so it's um, it's given access to a lot more content for um, students to um, download onto their mobile devices mm-hmm. whether it's a tablet or a phone sure um, and a lot of those are free as well mm. so um, as the DSA as you might be aware of they they come there's kind of standard packages that they'll recommend mm-hmm. um, which do cost money mm-hmm. um, but we're finding ourselves obviously training those packages but also integrating free free software as well mm-hmm. right um, and some of those things are, you know productivity tools um, you know if we break it down looking at different um, educational tasks mm-hmm. um, if we were looking at say um, note taking mm-hmm. um, there's a whole suite of um, apps now sure. that are totally catered for for note taking. Um, you've got the audio side for audio recording. Um, it still hasn't caught up there. Um, you know where the kind of phone or the or the, the tablet actually doubles up as a dictaphone. Mm-hmm. Um, the the quality is not fantastic, but there are a few um, ones called Audio Notes, mm-hmm. um, and there's another one called Audio Memos. Mm-hmm. So you can actually go into your lecture, just record it attach you know ha- actually write out notes that, yeah. that are linked to that um so by the time you get home from your from your lecture you've kind of got bullet points of what was covered in that lecture mm. plus the actual um live recording so you, you know you've got that as a basis to kind of go back and review if you need to mm. um and then you've got the other side of the note taking which everyone's probably aware of which is evernote yeah um so um evernote is one of the ones i sort of thought I would mention because it's kind of cross-platform yeah it works on all mobile devices mm. it's free um, and obviously um, you can download the desktop version of it as well mm. so um, you know you can be in your lecture um, taking a picture of some slides that they yeah. might have on the wall or um, in a team collaboration where you might be brainstorming some, mm-hmm. some ideas you mm-hmm. can take a picture of that incorporate it into your um, notes for that subject and um, it's not kind of just stuck on on that mobile platform yeah. you can then get back home get onto your desktop and then actually you know use that with your essay that you might be writing or exam mm. revision so it, you know it's got a lot of um capability really yeah and actually that's kind of what you were saying earlier paul that you know you shouldn't put that the way technology is going now is mm. you shouldn't just be tied to your your desk all the time you know that's right you, you should have that freedom to kind of take it on your smartphone or whatever it is yeah. and, and and i think the apps that you've just mentioned they allow you to do that they allow you to kind of be be, be more free in mm. terms of where you go and how you use the technology but everything syncs together so that you can be sat yeah. at your desktop if needs be to kind of put the finishing touches to what yeah. you're using well i mean the thing is i mean you know we we, we support a lot of staff they, they you know they, they get the tablet devices and all of these the tablet devices will have a a pre-installed note-taking application but by and large the notes will remain on the tablet yeah and so it's like well that's great but actually, how is that then any different to you making notes in a notebook? You, you've still got, you, you're not actually getting any added benefit from that. So we'll always try and say to people, look, try something like Evernote so that you can say, oh, yeah, no problem. I can grab this on my phone or on my tablet or on my, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I mean, I use Evernote literally for, for, for the day job. I couldn't do without it. Because yeah. I, can... I mean, you covered it quite extensively in the webinar you gave for RSA. Yeah, Wales, yeah. Didn't you? So, yeah. So, yeah. We, yeah. We're big fans of Evernote, but yeah, anything, anything really where where we can say to people, look, great, use the portable device, but then really quickly and easily get that the data off that and onto something else is is the main. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anything that does that, we're big fans of. You know. Integrate it, mm. definitely. I mean, Evernote, it, it's got a key keyword search as yeah. well, so you know all the content you put in can be easily found through mm. the, the meta tags that it's got. Um, but the other thing from an accessible point of view mm. is you know we're finding students um, perhaps with physical disabilities that mm. might find it hard to carry lots of textbooks around sure. yeah they can just put all that content into Evernote mm. um, because it's not restricted by any file format really mm. so you can put PDFs in there which mm. might be journal articles um, you know scans from the library you know um, of books sure um, so it's all there for them to carry around and access excellent I mean I thought I'm intrigued about and, uh, um, and hopefully this just 
could lead to some interesting discussions. But um, if, if someone comes to you and they say, I mean, I'm guessing this is how it works, if someone will come to you and say, uh, I have a particular need that I need resolving, how, what's the process that you go through to kind of look at the technologies that are available and work out which is the best technology or which technologies are best for them to meet their needs? Yeah, so there's a few ways we might find out through speaking to the student directly. Mm -hmm. um, we do sometimes get access to their um, needs assessment report as well, which kind mm -hmm. of details the psychological background of their education, um, the areas that they've struggled with mm -hmm. um, when it comes to academic work. Um, so we kind of use that as a, a perimeter before we go in to kind of put together a map of what, what we can do with the mm -hmm. technology. And this is a really interesting part is when you start to link with other educationalists so the study skills tutors mm. that are working with the, the students yeah. on a one-to-one -one basis. If we look at dyslexia, which is a really wide spectrum, sure. um, just on the one side, if we're looking at kind of um, processing issues, um, so um, if it's kind of looking at audio, trying to proce that, process mm -hmm. that into long-term memory, um, there's so many um, apps that, and, and technology that can help around those things. Yeah. Um, so kind of looking at a dictaphone or, or a mobile device that can record a session, um, looking at um, a program called Audio Note Taker, mm -hmm. um, which allows you to kind of um, transcribe that audio into there, make notes alongside it, mm -hmm. and also import the slides from the lecture. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of corresponds with, with the audio that's yeah. been recorded. Um, and that, you know, you're kind of going on lots of different learning styles there. You've mm -hmm. got the visual, you've got the auditory, and then you've also kind of got the kinesthetic of being, you know, typing, kind yeah. of, you know, assimilating what information is there into your own notes. Mm. Um, so the, the study skills tutors, they're already kind of working with um, students to kind of suggest coping strategies yeah. around the different needs that, that have been identified. And that's what we're kind of doing with the technology. So we're just looking at the best way to, to adapt it to, to, to that actual need that the student has. Mm. Yeah. And, I, you know, it, I'm, I'm just thinking back in um, a, a little while ago, I've been, I was working with a, a student um, who uh, had kind of visual impairment needs and um, needed sort of extra help in terms of her textbooks and the, the work that was given to her. Uh, and what happened on the day I was working with this particular student was that uh, somebody turned up with a pile of paper, probably sort of 50 or 60 sort of you know it was huge it was like about a foot's worth of paper all written in braille now that's great it was fantastic mm. she had her notes available but as a student you don't want to be carrying that stuff around so sure. any any way that technology can help to make life easier mm. for the students who you know who are trying to sort of make their way through uh university life on a day-to-day -day basis and it's difficult enough as it is anyway mm. without having to carry sort of lug things around with you and make life more more difficult mm. i think any any way that technology can help to improve yeah. that yes. is, is, has got to be a bonus isn't it so yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, and, and it sounds to me as if as if you, you kind of get in from the very beginnings with the student, find out what the issues are, and then kind of really put some effort into working out the best ways to resolve the problems that they're having. Yeah, and it's looking at where they are in the year as well. So if it was January to March time, they might be approaching exams. So yeah. kind of focusing on software that might help them with exam revision. Mm -hmm. um, but if I may go back to the kind of uh, um, the case study you were talking about, um, mm -hmm. image image to text programs are, are fantastic mm. for, for helping students you know carry a lot of content around sure um without it being weighty in their bags um yeah. i mean google goggles is is a really good mm, one yeah um it's got an ocr an optical character recognition engine mm -hmm. in there so it'll you can take a picture of um, a document um it'll convert that into digital text okay um and if it was um if they needed to have that read back to them they could then integrate that into a text to voice program mm -hmm. um, so then it speaks it speaks it back to them which they can do on their mobile devices mm -hmm. now and there's lots of free apps that do that mm -hmm. so um, I think they've got a few of them which are iSpeech mm -hmm. and Speak It Lite um, so there is a paid version of Speak It it's yeah. only 99p or something yeah. like mm -hmm. that um, but they can then just listen to that text that they've scanned in. Yeah. So it, it sounds like um, it, it's almost just saying well you're identifying several apps, which is a bit like a Lego kit, I guess. You're then combining that bespoke to that particular student's needs and going, well, you can use this in conjunction with this, and then that will help you Yeah, help you out. And, and we were all talking about the cloud mm. before, and I think that's really given us a new level to kind of integrate mm. it. Because mm. before, you kind of, 
it was all restricted to the device. Yeah. But now you can actually export these things to Dropbox yeah. or Box or yeah. you know Google Docs, um, and um, it's it's there then for them to access yeah. outside the app. So yeah. Well, when, when when we first started at Newport, well, like four or five years ago now, we would have. Back in the old days, people would just say, oh, you know, they'd taken a photograph on a digital camera, but they hadn't got the lead. Yeah. And we could <laughs> <laughs> And the computers we had didn't have SD card readers, so we couldn't even take the card out and slide it into anything. It was, but so these days, it's fantastic. You just say, well, yeah. take it, stick it on the cloud, and then access it as you, as you see fit. I was going to ask you a question about um, lecture capture, because um, this seems to be something that a lot of institutions are investing heavily in. In your experience, uh, so you're working with students with various uh, needs, requirements, is lecture capture in its own right uh, a solution to their accessibility issues, or is or do they need more than or something different to? And by lecture capture, I'm basically I'm talking about they they film the lecture, so you actually get to watch a video yeah. of the lecture standing there and talking. Is it, if everyone did that, would that be a significant bonus to the kind of folks you support? I think so because. Um... It takes away the ownership on the students mm. to always remember to do it as mm. well, um, and it makes it easier for collaboration. Yeah. So students could sit sit together, go through the material. Gotcha. Um, there are a lot of students that you know we've worked with to to help them get to that setup where they can record it themselves. Yeah. Um, so having you know where where all lectures are being rec- video recorded, yeah. I think it's a fantastic idea. Yeah. So yeah, so, so so I guess at the moment, so they're, they're almost saying, well, I've got to bring my equipment in. I've got to then mm. say to the lecturer, is it okay? Do you mind if I record you? Whereas if it was happening automatically, it's like, oh, that's not a problem. I can actually focus on maybe, you know, would learning it, stuff. Yeah, <laughs> just as an incidental, mm. would it need to be video or would it, you know, would it suffice audio? Because I know a lot of lecturers are nervous yeah, about being on video. This is true. But yep. they'd be happy with the audio. Mm. So an audio recording and giving people access obviously like you would normally on the VLE to like the slides and extra materials that they could then have read out or or whatever they need that be just as good yeah I think so um I mean the video side is um you know a lot of the the equipment students have it's it's not really doable for them to video Mm -hmm. record it even if the lecturer was happy about them doing it um so audio is kind of what they're used to anyway yeah and um when the video does come along and they can do that, then that will be an extra bonus, I think. Yeah. Uh, and one, one question I was going to ask, Jamie, actually, is, um, is predominantly the, the, the technology that you use, is it, is it mostly um, free and open source stuff, or, or is it kind of a mixture of free and paid for software that you work with? Um, it's a mixture, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the majority of the stuff that comes through the DSA is, mm. is usually paid for um, right. somehow. So there's, mm. there's a lot of um, productivity tools that they're, Sure, that but the students don't have to pay for that. Do that? The software is bought for them. It's already so bought. It's, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's the the apps now. So you know, a lot of these students do have the mobile platform. So um, there's a lot of things there that they can then download and access. So, elsewhere. The, so the stuff that they have that's part of the sort of DSA package, are there then apps available for most of those softwares? already you know in existence so essentially that you know they get the the paid for stuff but then the apps come along with it that allows the flexibility yeah and then the recent bets show um which, mm. which i heard you talking about in yes recent yes ones, yeah um that that was one of the big focuses of that um you know a lot of the software mm. companies saying you know we finally released an app now that's going to mm. kind of support the existing software so you know they could start their mind map off on the desktop Mm-hmm. Um, and then access it on their iPad um, and then carry on. You know, mm. if they're on the train, just carry on adding to that mind map. Or if they're revising, they might have all their content in the mind map, which they can then access on their iPad or right, you know, okay. on their Nexus. And I, I think they've had to. I mean, I noticed that as well at the Bet Show. And I think I, I think very quickly as a, as, a, as a company producing a particular software, you will be left behind very quickly if mm. there isn't a, an app to, to work alongside it to allow yeah. that flexibility. So, yeah, I noticed that more and more because um, we went to the Bet Show this year and last year. And I noticed it a lot less last year, but this year it seems to be the, the way forward. So... Oh yeah, there's been an explosion. Yeah, uh, and, and um, most of the, I mean, yeah, most of the the most successful apps are those companion ones where they go, we've already got a service that's established, but we're going to allow you to take that service with you wherever you might be to be able to interact with it or plug into it or feed data into it in some way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, we we I mean 
we we try and get um say yeah, Evernote is one of the things we try and get students using. Um, I haven't yet come across. Uh, and this might be just me. I haven't yet come across uh, a, a nice mind mapping tool that will work on a tablet or a portable device that will then sync up with an existing online. And I like Mind Forty Two. I, I yeah. think that's. Uh, and um, there are other ones available, but I know there are mind map, there's mind mapping tools you can get for the for portable devices, but I haven't yet quite seen one that's. I don't know if you've seen one, Jamie, at all. That's that kind of seamlessly kind of lets you. Well, I'll make a mind map here, and I'll be, and they can edit it on a web browser and on a computer. Yeah, it's it's still a it's still the area we're all waiting for. Mm. Really, um, there's uh, there's a couple like um, Simple Mind, which yeah. is free, um, but I mind map, which is I think it's only available on the iPad, it right. might be out on the Nexus now, mm -hmm. um, it, you do pay for that, um, mm. but the good thing about that one, it does allow you to export to some of the software packages gotcha. that are out there, yeah. um, but at the moment, you know, none of the sort of main mind, mind mapping programs, you know, have actually yeah. released it. I wish, I wish Evernote would just say, right, we're going to let you make an, a mind map type of note, because that would be amazing, because yeah. you yeah. could then put in all of your you know, photographs and sound clips and everything. It'd be If anybody from Evernote yeah. is listening, then uh, <laughs> you know the way forward. I was going to ask a question. I mean, uh, obviously, um, if students wanted to make use of your service, um, is it all paid for again by uh, the DSA? Is it that is how indeed, it works? Yeah. Wow. So yeah. to them, there's no cost at all. It's just a case of saying, can you help me? I've got this need. And yeah. But if they need to do it, they have to do it through the uni, don't they? And they have to do the statement to reveal their disability, basically. Because there's still mm. students who will hide the fact that they've got something like dyslexia or yeah. something and not reveal it. And they don't realise that they're entitled to an enormous amount of help mm, and absolutely. assistance. Yeah. I was going to raise that point, actually, about the, the, the perceived uh, stigma. that we, we do get a lot of students, like Elizabeth said, who, who genuinely won't come forth and go, look, I, I need a bit of help with this because they think... There's some kind of uh, stigma associated with it. And mm. uh, I haven't actually experienced, I don't think it's a, a real, I think it's all a, perce a perceived thing because my experience of students and staff in general is that they would want to help. It doesn't matter, you know, yeah. who you I, are, what you've got going on. Yeah. We just want to help people. I spoke but... to someone in induction and they were a mature student mm. and they said it comes from back when they were kids and yeah. it was shameful. Mm. Yeah. You know, you were really embarrassed and now it's so open and mm. easy that they, you know, it's it's another world. Mm. But it's just breaking through that barrier that's already yes. put in place from a previous bad experience. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And I guess you must come across that there must be people who kind of who are after help and support, but they, you know, it's it's where do you go to get that first mm. thing and how do you break through that barrier? Yeah, and I think sometimes there's a misconception about the training as well and mm. the support that they get. So, um, you know, that some will just kind of look at the training as IT training, yeah, which yeah. Um, it, it really isn't. Mm. We're kind of looking at strategies to kind of incorporate around the disability. Sure. But going back to the point um, that was raised, I think there is that a lot of the students we do see have been diagnosed quite late on. Mm. So they're, they're 18 or above. Mm. Um, so they might have only just found out they're dyslexic. Um, mm. And there is a shyness I suppose to come forward about yeah. some of those things which I, I don't understand why there should be because it no no yeah I mean do, I mean I mean I suppose the other thing that would kind of if, if if I put was put myself in that position let's say I'd gone through the education system and, and not been diagnosed I'd be well slightly miffed I think <laughs> because <laughs> that's putting it like this, this is our family friendly podcast uh, but but I mean do, do you find that a, a lot of the people that come to you kind of like frustrated are they relieved are they angry or is there a whole kind of range of emotions that goes with that i mean i'd probably say a lot are more relieved yeah um because they've kind of gone through primary and secondary school thinking yeah. you know um i learn a little bit different to everyone else yeah and now i know why yeah um and it's it's not odd at all because mm. uh, you know everyone's the, the the education system's built uh, heavily along you know written documents absolutely yeah. which which yeah. pays dividends to some people yeah. but other people learn differently yeah. so um there's there's a lot to be taken from people that learn differently absolutely um and and so that's where we see the the actual kind of relief really mm. on, on their on their faces to see that they, they know understand how they learn now as yeah. well 
there are there are huge debates going on right now in academia in terms of assessment and feedback and how do you truly test someone's knowledge and understanding? Is it is it better to do it by an exam mm. or coursework? Or actually, are there other yeah. other ways of doing it, which maybe other education systems in the world are kind of embracing, but here in, in Great Britain, we're kind of, we, we're not yet there with it. I think there's, there's still kind of holding on to this old kind of exams, exams, yeah, yeah. exams, yeah. or essays and, and, and things like that, you know. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, and you and you see it with the students now. Um, you know, they, they they're starting university, and what always surprises our trainers and the tutors is um, they've never really been taught how to do various study skill tasks. Mm. So what what does uh, you know an A star essay look like, yeah. or um, you know what are kind of exam revision techniques that I could use mm. to really help me kind of put into long term memory, yeah. um, planning and organizing my work those types of things so mm. you know i think there's a need earlier in education to mm. kind of show show um, everyone how to write an essay and how to mm. compose it and structure it and how to get your ideas and thoughts into a structured context mm. um but with the technology it certainly does help those processes yeah um i mean going back to the mind mapping one I, you know um what's quite remarkable there is you can compose a whole mind map um which is based around your essay. Yeah. So you don't even need to go into Microsoft Word yeah. or um, Apple's pages. You mm. can just compose it in mind map and then just export it to Word at, at the very end. It kind of forces forces you to kind of break down essay questions and put them into different topic areas. Mm. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a way of kind of proofing, making sure that you're answering all the different parts sure. of the essay. Jamie, what about yourself? And so, I mean, obviously, you, you're you're an advocate of technology. You're an advocate of, of people using technology to their advantage to get whatever they need to, to, to. What kind of technologies do you use to actually run run the company to 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 do the job? Well, I mean, some of that does come down to money, um, yeah, of course. But, <laughs> of um, course. Yeah, no, I'd like to say I'm I'm absolutely pushing all kinds of technology mm. through the company, but it, it does come down to money. So mm. we are kind of um, moving to cloud based solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so. We're just upgrading our website, so it's going to be having kind of a learning forum on there yeah. where um, students will be able to download content. It's responsive as well, so it means that it'll adapt to whether they're on an iPhone or mm -hmm. um, they're on a tablet or on their desktop. Um, so it's little things like that that, are, um, that we can control quite easily mm. um, that we're trying to, you know, um, roll out to, to the students and the clients. Oh, wonderful. Uh, myself, I, I do a little bit of app development as well. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're kind of looking at a mobile learn platform as yeah. well. Um, so just pushing content through that. Mm. Is that going to be on the Apple Store or is it going to be on Android or both? Or, it's going to be on both. Or yeah. Both, wow. Yeah. yeah. And you're doing the coding for both platforms yourself? Uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Where do you find the time to do all this stuff? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I've been wanting to get into app development for eighteen months now. I'm just like, no, I've got two small children. I can't. You know, it's um, oh, it's a lot more accessible than everyone makes it out to be. Yeah. I think it's it, it's quite a daunting prospect, but when you start breaking it down, yeah, um, looking behind the scenes, and, and it's all free as well. So mm. if you look at if you were interested in iOS development, then mm. there's a program called Xcode, which is free to download. Right. Yeah. Uh, Android have got their own equivalent, mm -hmm. and Windows eight have now got their equivalent mm. as well so there's similarities between all platforms um they use um you know quite a visual interface mm. um, and then there's the coding that connects up to it wow so very very much a hands-on kind of uh, owner of a company as opposed to just kind of sitting there and going getting various people to do things you're actually getting your hands dirty as well as yeah i mean i Fantastic. like i mean I'll, I'll always carry on training as well yeah sure yeah. Because I, I like to see the application of what we're doing. I, I was going to ask Jamie: um, is, Are there a kind of one or two um, particular bits of software that you tend to find more and more are, are kind of the key ones that you're working with people with? Would you, you know? Are there one or two things you could pick out and say these are the main ones that seem to be recurring over and over again that are, that are helping people out the most? And I wonder if you could give us a couple of examples of things that that did that, so we could, you know, the listeners might want to perhaps drop in and have a go of them using them themselves. Yeah, absolutely. I mean. I... One one that they can access at home, I think, is looking at like the cloud based solutions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's so many varieties out there. Mm -hmm. um, but if it was um, a deal maker, then they might want to look at kind of SkyDrive mm -hmm. on Microsoft yep. or um, you know Google Drive. Mm -hmm. um, the, the benefit of those two systems is that it connects up to the document management system, so they can edit in, in 
in the actual browser. Mm. So, um, you know, a lot of our students are saying they're losing their USB keys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they can actually just sync it all to their cloud space. Mm. Um, and if they forget their laptop when they go home to see the parents, they can still access the, mm. their essay and carry on writing in it. I mean, do students contact you once they've graduated and they go off into employment? Do you ever hear, do they ever come, come back to you and go, oh, this is what I'm doing now and yeah. thank you very much? And Yeah, we've had a few stories like that. Um, I mean, some of the mind mapping programmes, yeah. um, I mean, the corporate sector seems to sort of follow suit sometimes with the mm. DSA. So, you know, that a lot of them are using mind mapping software mm. now for problem solving. Yeah. So some of the students, when they go into a corporate setting, have kind of got the experience already with the software. Yeah. So they're able to kind of lead it sometimes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've had a lot. Of oh, feedback yeah. Is there is there a, a, tight, a particular bit of software that you can name drop that perhaps listeners might be able to kind of go out and search for it um yeah so there's a, the, the two main ones that they use in the dsa are called claro um claro read mm-hmm. and text help um but then there's the free ones like i speech and speak it penalty with those um oh. yeah that's really good and if people wanted to learn more about yourself um the company are, are you guys on twitter what you got a website uh, how could people find yeah. out a bit more about what, you yeah. know, what you do uh, our website is going through a bit of an upgrade but mm-hmm. um, it'll, um, if you go to www.mckendy.com okay. um, I'll send you the link as yeah, well yeah sure definitely. Um, and also um, if you just go through to student services um, support services then they'll also signpost us as well So wonderful yep that's fantastic <laughs> Okay, so that's about all we've got time for uh, for this week. So I would just like to say a massive thank you to James for coming in. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and uh, listening to all the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and um, thank you very much to uh, my colleague Carl Sykes. Carl, if people want to get in touch with you, are you on Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? Yes, I am on yeah. Twitter. <laughs> yes. Um, my, my Twitter handle is at Carl, C-A-R-L, underscore Sykes, S-Y-K-E-S, underscore Tell, T-E-L. So it's at Carl underscore Sykes underscore Tell. Okay. So if you've got any if you've got any questions about anything we talked about on the podcast, uh, you can send them to Carl. Alternatively, we've got Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what's your Twitter handle? It's at Elizabeth underscore Lucy. And thank you very much indeed for this week. And if you want to get in touch with me, my Twitter handle is at Paul's underscore e-learning. So um, thank you very much indeed, and we hope to be speaking to you soon. Bye.